Well, howdy ho, everybody. Uh, welcome to another episode of our regularly unscheduled programming. Today's episode is going to be a little bit different from my uh, usual material, which is almost always horrendous and full of profanity and such and so forth. Uh, today, I actually want to make something a little bit more educational, uh, hopefully help a few guys out who are trying to wrench on their old Ford trucks and getting them back on the road. So in light of that, I want to make a video explaining in hopefully great detail how to completely disassemble and rebuild a Borg Warner 1356 transfer case. If you're watching this video, it's probably because you're trying to figure out what to do, what to plan for, what to get. And uh, hopefully uh, I do a good enough job of that. Uh, hopefully, you know, give you some nice educational instructional content here. I just want to say if, uh, you know, you're a little bit apprehensive, you've never done something like this before, and, uh, it's all right. Don't stress out. Uh, the Borg Warner 1356 is actually not very complicated to disassemble and reassemble. And I think uh, at the end of all of this, if you follow along, you'll probably come to the conclusion that it was probably not worth worrying about. So that being said, I'm going to try to be as concise as I possibly can. I'm going to try to do the best job that I possibly can. And uh, I'm going to try to avoid dropping any four letter words as I'm accustomed to doing which is going to be pretty difficult because <laughs> at this point I'm not going to lie it's uh, pretty much compulsory for me to do so and if this is the first video on my channel that you're watching uh, I highly encourage you to not view any of my other videos especially if you got little ears around the corner or uh, sitting right beside you but you know if you don't then by all rights uh, you know crack open a cold one and uh, enjoy the production that I'm fixing to put on the interwebs. So the 1356 that I'm going to be tearing apart today is a an OBS transfer case it's a manual shift transfer case and you can tell because normally on the 8th gen F-series trucks, also known as the Brick Nose trucks, you would have a, uh, a speedometer gear right here, which incidentally I actually have a transfer case for my Brick Nose. One moment. So this right here is a, uh, a transfer case out of an 87 to 91, also known as Brick Nose. As you can see where that plug was on the uh, other transfer case, there's this guy right here. And there's a, a gear, a ring gear, that goes in your uh, tail shaft there. And that's what uh, tells your speedometer to do speedometer things. Whereas on the OBS trucks, like this one here, uh, it reads the speed from the rear differential using a Hall effect sensor with a, uh, uh, a gear on the side of the ring gear. And I think I just stated this, but if you have an electronic four-wheel drive module, uh, this is not going to be the guide for you. The difference between uh, electronic shift and manual shift is you have this lever right here for manually actuating and switching uh, ratios or uh, for, uh, drive modes rather and uh, on the electronic system there would be uh, a servo attached right here with a, uh, a drive shaft that goes into there and that would select your gears depending on what button you pushed that and I believe there's a Hall effect sensor in uh, this part of the gear case but being that this is an OBS and it's also manual shifting, we don't have to worry about any of those things. So uh, that this is the transfer case that there at least the variation of the 1356 that I'm going to be uh, demonstrating. And this transfer case has uh, just shy of 250,000 miles. 
that's generally about the benchmark or at least the point that you'll want to do a rebuild on this because as you can see with this unit the uh, the rear seal the, uh, for the uh, slip yoke is uh, she's she's not in good condition and she's leaking a little bit so I figure with the mileage that it's at and with the rear seal doing its thing uh, high time for a rebuild and I might as well show you all how to do that I've done this uh, a couple of times before it's actually not difficult so there's no reason to sweat it so I would like to go over some of the tools you're gonna need uh, to do this type of a job and if you'll forgive me for being one-handed there we go so we're gonna want a, uh, a bearing race slash seal driver kit I'm using one from Maddox, which is sold at the Hazardous Freight. Uh, this is going to be used for driving out bearings and uh, installing a couple of the new seals. Now, in the event that the bearings and seals are not wanting to be cooperative, have an assortment of uh, punches and a couple of chisels, God forbid, if it ever comes to that point, ideally it shouldn't. But just in case it does, um, your second choice is going to be this here brass drift punch. You're also going to want a couple of pairs of snap ring pliers. Very heavy duty snap ring pliers. One for uh, external, actually this would be internal, right? One for internal and one for external snap rings again you want the uh, a pair of snap ring pliers that's really beefy because uh, I've seen several people try to repair their transfer cases on the forums and they get the uh, the snap ring pliers at the auto parts store of their choosing and it's the ones with the cheesy uh, dinky little tips on the front of them so you definitely want to have a, a really good pair of beefy snap ring pliers. Again, internal and external snap rings. We're going to want a T50 Torx, preferably on a socket. We're going to need a seal puller. We're also going to need a half inch breaker bar. A 30 mil no 32 millimeter socket. This is optional. You don't really have to have uh, necessarily a ketchup bottle or I guess condiment dispenser for this tip particular application. But uh, as you're assembling uh, your components, particularly the bearings, you're gonna wanna add just a tickle of uh, ATF to those components and I wanted to add you should probably in fact you should definitely get transmission fluid that is Motorcraft XL12 uh, certified so in this case I'm using AMS oil uh, signature series it's the one with the red cap and the GoPro doesn't really do a very good job of showing it but uh, on the back of the label I'll throw up a uh, picture here of the specifications it is, in fact, uh, Ford Motorcraft uh, Mercon, basically uh, number one through five, and it does have the XL12 certification. And the reason that's important is XL12 used to be the de facto uh, ATF that you would use in these transfer cases because the XL12 wouldn't eat away your seals. The older versions of Mercon would uh, tear up your internals. Uh, it didn't agree with the, uh, the internal pump, which we'll get to. So you want something that's uh, XL12, Motorcraft XL12 certified. And the last thing we're going to need is a bearing and seal kit some of these are a little bit more optional than others but this kit I got from Torque King 
It includes uh, uh, the, all the gaskets, all the seals, and all the bearings that you need to completely rebuild a 1356. To my knowledge, this is the, the best rebuild kit that you can possibly buy. Um, Torque King is one of those very few companies that I will happily shill out of the kindness of my own heart. Um, I got a rebuild kit from them for my Dana 50 twin beam front suspension and my F250. And everything just was 100% compatible. I mean, there's not much else to say. But, um, yeah, if you're looking for a complete rebuild kit minus the uh, drive chain, and yeah, we'll get to that later. But, yeah, every seal, every bearing, this kit has it. So, highly recommend it. This uh, drip tray is optional. However, I... I'm going to use this just to catch any of the ATF that leaks out of the case. Ideally, you will have already drained most, if not all of it. But, you know, you, you can't get every single last drop, so that's what this is for. And because we're going to start on this half of the case, I cut up exactly four two buys and just stack them one on top of each other. That way you can rest the case on top of there and you can do a lot of your work from this side of it. And with that out of the way, I think we are pretty well on our way to getting this done. So I say let's get on her. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this pick and I'm gonna go into the uh, star splines of all of these Torx bolts and get all the built up garbage that accumulates in them over the years. It's kind of like that right there except it's inside the uh, the drive of that bolt and we're going to do this for every single last one of these. It's just going to make getting your T50 much much easier it's going to allow you much more purchase and it's going to minimize the risk of you stripping out the head of the fastener all right so we're gonna go ahead and bust off all these bolts i'm going to use a breaker bar attached to my uh, t50 socket and the reason for that is i don't like using an impact at least not initially on these uh on these bolts here the casing of this uh, transfer case is a uh, magnesium alloy it's pretty uh, pretty delicate relatively speaking I mean don't get me wrong I love the uh, the durability of the NP205 but when you're dealing with a uh, Two, three hundred pound chunk of cast iron. I don't know. At some point it becomes counterproductive. You know what I mean? So, anyway, basically all that to say, I'm going to get started with this breaker bar. And we're going to get these four bolts loose. Pretty sure these are locked tight and in place. Hit. All right, now that we got those broken loose, there's really no fear of using an impact on this. out set these to the side I believe all of these t50 bolts are of the same length 
so I don't really have any issue with just throwing them all in one spot. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take our breaker bar and go up underneath these uh, pry bosses and we're going to torque it that way to sort of bust off the RTV. Man, you remember when Craftsman was made in the USA? I do. Fuck, I miss Sears. Oh, I just said a four letter word. I apologize. Told you that was going to happen eventually. All right, now we just pull off our uh, extension housing here. Set that aside. Now we're going to do is we're going to take this rubber washer and sneak it over top of these splines here. Yeah. We're going to want to hold on to this guy. Uh, the kit doesn't come with one of these and we don't need to replace it. It's perfectly good. So, All right, now we got that rear extension housing off. We're going to temporarily flip this thing onto its side like so. And we're going to go ahead and pull off this front yoke here. I'm going to give her a shot of croil just so it has a snowball's chance in hell of actually busting loose with relative ease. Let that eat for a few seconds. Oh, ladybug just flew in my face. Okay, now we got that out of the way. We're going to take our impact with our 32 millimeter socket and a big old dirty pair of channel locks. We're gonna, so the channel locks are to hold the yoke steady. And then we're gonna put that 32 mil socket on there. Let's see, is she on there? All right, let's see if she busts off. And off she goes. And all right, we're gonna take that uh, retaining nut and we're gonna add it to the pile. I also like to mention that a Chrome 32 deep is really realistically the only way to get in there because I have a snap on 32 mil and for whatever reason it just doesn't it's the the impact sockets, the black ones are really thick walled and thus are uh, too, I don't have enough clearance in there. I don't know why, really weird. Anyway, let's see if we can get this off of there, pull this yoke off, make sure we keep this with, uh, keep this washer with the nut there. Go ahead and pull our yoke off. And there's our front yoke right there. All right, now with a, uh, a 22 millimeter wrench, we're gonna go ahead and uh, try to remove our four wheel drive range selector. I need a better purchase angle on that fastener there. Yeah. All right, I'll unscrew that. That is you, what tells your PCM whether you are in four high or four low. All right, now from that same angle that we uh, just took the uh, range sensor out, which was right there, we're now going to try to drive out this here seal. And this one can be a little bit tricky from what I remember. So what I'm gonna do is get up under this rubber. Yeah. Try to pry it out a little bit. I don't want to dig into the case too much here. Try to not mar this as much as possible because again the case is magnesium. Ah, almost got it. So now I'm gonna 
just slowly work it around it. Ah, oh, there it goes. All right. All right, well, there's that. That can go right in the garbage. Yeah, that's what I was talking about. That's what I was talking about when I said be careful with uh, careful with this case. It's really delicate. It didn't cut all the way into it, but man. All right, so now we're gonna zoom over to the front output shaft side, and we're gonna do basically the exact same thing. Just gonna pry the outer lip of the seal. This one's a little bit less painful. At least it should be. I don't think I should have to bust out the chisel for this one, but I guess we'll find out. Yeah, give you a little bit of a better view as to what I'm trying to do. Hopefully it ain't too blurry for you. What I'm trying to do here is get up under that lip with my seal puller. Thus far as being a little bit of pain, so I'll try to use a screwdriver as a punch here, which is totally what you shouldn't do. But who are we kidding? If they didn't want me to use a screwdriver as a punch, then they wouldn't have made it a flathead screw. Yeah, there's no Slide this in there. Man, they do not make this easy. Oh, you filthy bastard. Come on. Yep. Almost got a grip on her. Oh, we should be able to do this. Should. <laughs> no. I believe There she goes. Here she come eventually. They always do. Yeah, not without casualties though. Now well, it's not completely ruined, but definitely not mint. All right. Well, let's get this thing back into uh, its original position that I had it, and start taking the back case half off. All right. We got our flip back over onto the. 2x4 stand that I built for it, and this is a uh, rear output shaft. Now in here we got this uh, snap ring here that we got to remove, and then uh, this is where the hefty snap ring pliers come into play. Let's see. Now let me get you, let me get you some better lighting. All right. I got the angle head snap ring pliers. All right, with that uh, rear snap ring gone, we can now start on all 12 of uh, the Torx bolts. They're the same T50 as the ones on the uh, output shaft extension and they go thusly. got all 12 of those bolts removed and by the way uh, my suspicions were confirmed those are all the exact same uh, T50 bolts same as the ones that went up there obviously so with those out of the way we can now completely separate this case half from the bottom well technically this is the front but we're gonna call this the top so right into here what you're going to do 
you're going to take your half inch pry bar, even though it's the three eighths, uh, you're going to take your half inch pry bar and you're going to wedge the drive. Oh, my light's dying on me. You're going to wedge the drive right in there. And then there's another one right over here on the other side. It's false. And there's also one right there. And I think that's pretty much it. Oh, no, no, no. There's also one right there. So uh, we're going to go ahead and get these two case halves pried apart. I'm going to change the uh, battery in this rocket light. Apparently it's getting low. So that's cool. stopping me. There we go. Forgot to mention there are these uh, locating dowel pins in the, in between the cases and sometimes those can give you a pretty big headache but we got her figured out. All right, now at this point, there really shouldn't be a whole lot stopping us from pulling these two case halves apart. These dowel pins can be a little bit tricky sometimes. Just give them a little help with the screwdriver, and they should just that. And off she comes. No problemo. All right, so now that we got the uh, top case off sitting there next to the tail shaft uh, housing sitting there percolating there's a uh, snap ring right here that we're going to remove and then we're going to slide our uh, four-wheel drive uh, lockup assembly off the shaft thusly there's a big old beefy snap ring too this is why i say Having a good beefy pair of snap ring pliers worth its weight in gold in that operation. See how easy that was? Yeah, one of those cheapo pairs of uh, snap ring pliers from the auto parts store. If you're particular choosing, oh boy howdy, that would have been a nightmare. I don't even want to imagine how difficult that would have been. So we're going to go ahead and Stash that with that. And we're going to take our lockup assembly and we should just be able to slide that right off the shaft. That guy right there goes like that. And we'll set that to the side. Now we're going to take this whole object right here, our shift fork assembly, complete with the shifting ring and everything on it. And we're just going to lift this bad boy right on out of there. And we're just going to set her off to the side, just like everything else. Now I do want to note, you can take this off. This is an optional step. You can uh, take this apart. There is a snap ring in there. However, it is not required. And uh, I'm not going to lie, I've been down this road before. It's kind of a pain. I don't want to do that again. So we're just not going to. So we'll keep that with that. And we'll set that off to the side. I would like to point out again that uh, now is a really good time to check your, t uh, your drive chain for any uh, play or any droop. Over time, these chains can stretch out a little bit, and uh, that'll cause problems of its own later on down. So what I do is I hold the, uh, the rear output shaft in a stationary place, and we just uh, wheel the chain back and forth a little bit. And it has the normal amount of play. Uh, it's not an alarming amount whatsoever. And uh, okay, cool. I am good with that. 
Now what we got going on is there's a snap ring, another OD snap ring right here. Now the best way I found to get that thing out of there is to wedge a pair of snap ring pliers in there and sort of get her out of there. Yeah, like I said, very difficult. But, a good pair of pliers, you will be able to get that thing off of there. Now I'm just going to work it up. A screwdriver on each side. I don't know if there's a tool for this, or if there's a proper procedure, but we did get that off of there, and uh, that's now free. So now, what we should be able to do is lift both the drive sprocket and the driven sprocket out simultaneously. Let's see. Oh, forgot about the washer. I'll set that aside with the ring. This can be a little bit challenging, so you do have to lift these out simultaneously. Uh, come on now. Uh, there we go. And out she comes. Okay, so this big dowel right here, this is our shift rail. We're just going to slide her right on out of there. Set that to the side. Now we should be able to take this fork. We're going to slide it this way. So basically what you do is you take the cam, take it back like that, and you can remove your high-low shift fork complete with uh, your hub right there. All right, so now that all gone, we can go ahead and get rid of this for now, for the time being, and we're gonna go ahead and flip this whole thing right on back over. All right, now what we gotta do is deep inside there, I don't know if you can see it. If you can't see it, then I'll go ahead and snap a picture and put it on screen. But uh, there's another snap ring right there holding this shaft in place. And guess what? We need to get rid of it. And like the front output shaft snap ring, it's exactly like one of these. It's not like one of these where it has those holes where you, those detents where you can easily get your snap ring pliers in there it ain't like that so uh, it's just like one of those ones over there it's kind of uh kind of tricky to get to and i'll do my best to try to get you to you know have a good view at it but i ain't making no promises so i'm gonna do the best i can here Ah, there she goes. Woo, man, that spring is an absolute terror, I tell you. Good going, Borg Warner. Thanks a lot. Okay, as you may or may not have seen, the uh, shaft fell down into the hole there, which means we can now pull the case off and there is our planetary gear set. Now I want to say something very important about this thing. This is not, I repeat, this is not a, uh, a serviceable part. If you find that your gears have undue wear or any this, that, and the other, uh, you have to replace the whole entire thing. I know there are people who have attempted to service these things and they failed miserably. And this is not an inexpensive component to try to source. So my uh, best advice is just set this off to the side. 
just like everything else and we'll all be happy. All right, we're very near the end of uh, getting this whole thing taken apart. So next logical step is, I believe, either the sun gear. Yeah, you know what, let's go, let's go ahead and remove the sun gear. So this right here is your sun gear. Can you see that? Can you see it? Scooch it up a little bit, yeah. So this whole thing right here is your sun gear. And there are two, <laughs> guess what's holding it in? Big ass snap ring. So this one is actually not very difficult. You just take a uh, snap ring, or not a snap ring, a uh, flathead screwdriver. I'm saying snap ring so many times so far, it's kind of getting to be a force of habit. Use this one to pry outward and use the thin one to pry upward, see if that works. Come on now. Okay. And you just keep doing that all along the exterior. You want to make sure you're prying it outward and then using a smaller screwdriver to pry upward a little bit to uh, eventually get this thing out of its hole. Oh no. That's what I get for getting cocky. And the whole damn thing just went right back into its home base. Okay. There we go. Just work your way around and eventually she'll come out. Now what we can do is we can remove the sun gear. Come on now. There we are. Nice good sun gear. And then we set it to the side. All right, hopefully you got a good view of this. Now that we got that sun gear out of the equation, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the shift fork and we're gonna make sure, or the shift cam rather, this guy right here. We're gonna make sure she's all the way forward. If she isn't, then, you know, just do that. That's all that takes. And then what we can do is flip this over and uh, take our shift lever right here, send it back one position. And what that's going to do is that's going to put this in neutral. Well, it would be in neutral, but, well, there ain't a gear set for it to be in neutral. And in the same hole where you took out your four-wheel drive range sensor, there's gonna, your uh, shifter dealio, hang on, let me get you a better viewage of it. All right, a little bit better view here. So, started right there, shift that back that way one position as we're looking at it this way. Yeah, you probably can't see it. But uh, there's a, uh, a T20 down in there that you can only see when you shift it into neutral. So we got our T20 in there. And then we're going to back that off. And that's that. And there's our set screw right there. So we'll set that off to the side. Now we'll take our shift lever, and it should be able to just slide right out of there. And a ladybug just hit me in the face. And there you go, there's your shift lever. So we'll put that right next to the set screw. And we'll flip this guy back over. I heard something do a thunk. Oh, oh, oh. Let's 
So we have a few things going on here. All right, so uh, once you remove that grub screw, which threads into your cam there, uh, you pull out your shift lever right there, and there's this D-ring shape right there that corresponds with the shift lever right there, and out falls your cam, your spring, and the bushing that rides on that spring. So outside of all of the bearings and a few seals, a couple of seals actually, that is a completely disassembled Borg Warner 1356 transfer case. So let's go ahead and focus our attention to those two case halves with what remains of those seals. Alright, so now we got uh, most of our stuff out of our case what we're gonna do is we got the front case sitting up here on the bench we're gonna go ahead and get rid of our bearings this is for the front output shaft and what you'll notice is we have a snap ring in there and in order to get this snap ring out we have to uh, pry out on these guys here and then progressively go around the, the the circumference of it and eventually it'll just pop out and then we'll be able to drive out our bearings so we're gonna get the snap ring out and then we're gonna get the snap ring out for the uh, the main input and then we're gonna pop both these bearings out so the way to do this is a little bit unorthodox kind of like a lot of things that we've been doing around here so we're gonna get the side pried off actually I should probably do this with a slightly bigger driver so again we're just gonna drive this guy out of there not a whole lot of science behind it it's just uh, get your screwdriver behind it and slowly pop the perimeter out much like so be nice and gentle with it and there she goes and the front input very much the same in fact it's almost exactly the same just a little bit bigger and uh, once you pop that out here we're gonna be ready to flip this whole uh, front case cover upside down and we'll get our bearings dri driven out all right so we got her flipped over on her front and when, after getting both of those snap rings removed the main input bearing snap ring is exactly the same as the front output shaft bearing uh, in terms of getting rid of the snap rings uh, I apologize for uh, not being able to record getting the front bearing out my GoPro kind of overheated and stopped recording middle during the middle of the removal process so what I got going on here is I got two two by fours and the reason I'm spacing these up a little bit is there are these two dowel pins one on uh, each side here and I don't want that to dig into the my bench top here while I'm in the process of pounding it out so that's why that's like that and like I said I already got the uh, front output shaft bearing out and what I use to do that is this uh, bearing race and seal driver and I'm using the 59 millimeter uh, front driver and you get a bunch of drivers in the kit and you just I don't know, screw them on and that will allow you the perfect clearance to not uh, hit the the uh, the surface where your snap ring rides against but also be able to uh, drive out your bearing now again apologize wasn't able to uh, get recording of that front bearing I have since 
disabled voice command because apparently that was uh, also giving me problems too whenever I would use the word stop or anything that uh, sounded like stop it would well it would stop recording and that's kind of not uh, the goal of today's programming but we still have uh, another bearing that I can demonstrate getting rid of so the way we're going to get the, both these bearings out is they pound out that way or we drive them out that way obviously since we got rid of the snap ring so I think the 59 mil driver will work but I'm going to switch over to a slightly bigger one just so I have a little bit more surface area to play with. Okay, so now we got ourselves the, I think it's a 65, yeah, the 65 millimeter driver. Just a little bit more surface area to contend with there. And we're going to take our big old ball peen hammer that totally doesn't have a wobbly head on it from being used all these years. And we're just going to give her a few thwacks and drive her right on out of there. There she is, that's all there is to it. Go ahead and flip that over. And that is your main input shaft bearing. And we'll see, oh, this one's actually pretty good. Didn't even need to change it, but we're going to anyway. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna flip the uh, front case half over to the part where our shift lever would normally be. Uh, and also this is your range uh, sensor right there so that gives you any idea where we're facing and what we're gonna do is we're gonna get rid of this little rubber seal right here now I had to take a plastic tool there to do a little bit of excavating <laughs> she <laughs> she's a little bit dirty I mean this truck was a gravel truck for the longest time so I guess that uh, makes sense. Yep, there it is. We're just gonna pry that guy out of there just like that. Out she comes. So what this guy is, I almost forgot to mention, this is your uh, seal that goes on the shaft of your shift lever. And obviously that keeps the fluid from pouring out of there when under normal use. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our front case half fully dissected, uh, minus the vent uh, hose fitting there. I'm not going to, I don't think I'm going to get rid of that. It's fine the way it is. Uh, at this point, we're going to clean this guy up. Uh, I don't think I <laughs> should have to show you how to do this, so I'm going to do that completely off camera. This video is going to be long enough as is, but... We're going to get this guy cleaned up and we're going to get the back case half thrown up on the bench and we'll drive out all the things that we need to do to get that one prepped and ready to clean. So now we have the back case half out and we have two things that we potentially need to get rid of. Alright, so now we have the back case half up here on our little table here and there are two things that we need to get rid of aside from our uh, fill and drain ports. Well, that's kind of obvious though. So we have the bearing for the rear output shaft and then we have the bearing, the caged kneel bearing for the front output shaft. Now, I am not going to replace this bearing on account of it actually very rarely uh, goes bad, but if you did want to replace this bearing, there is, there is a tool it's much like what you would use to remove a pilot bearing where you, uh, you have two forks, one that grab on each side, and then you slowly uh, drive a screw in there and it pulls it out, and then you reinstall it. Again, these very, very rarely ever go bad, so I'm going to opt to leave this in there. That night kind of also... Uh, don't have a tool to do that but what I do have a tool to do is this bearing now being that there's no snap ring uh, holding this one in what we need to do is we need to drive it from this side 
out that way. The tool that we're going to use to drive that out is again our bearing race and seal driver and we're going to be using the 59 millimeter just like we did on the front output shaft bearing. Same process only different. Well, that's our back case completely disassembled and of note your uh, bearings at least the ones that go from your front and your rear output shaft uh, they're exactly the same so in case you're looking to order parts that's what it is and the rear output shaft bearing is actually in much better shape than the one for the front which is really weird Usually it's the opposite. Your rear output shaft obviously uh, experiences way more use and abuse than the front one. Weird. Alright, so our last and final operation of uh, today is to get this rear output shaft seal. This is from the rear axle or uh, the rear uh, housing, extension housing for the rear output shaft. And to do this, we're going to get a punch right up under here and we're going to drive her out that way. There's a little bit of a tedious operation and of course we don't want to use a screwdriver. We're going to use a proper punch for this, but yes, we do need to drive this out that way. They do make a tool for this, but uh, as far as I know, only four dealerships sell them. So we're just going to do this a good old fashioned way. And I do want to mention the best way to do this probably is to clamp this in a vise and give yourself some uh, redneck soft jaws clamping it uh, with a hand towel or like, like a piece of rubber or some kind of basically anything to keep it from marring the outside of the extension housing here. So um, you do want to be careful when clamping it. You won't want to pull. Uh, you don't want to apply too much force to it. Again, this is magnesium alloy. Uh, you do not want to purposely mess it up if you don't absolutely have to. You want to apply just enough force that the uh, clamping force that is that it holds it while you're hammering away at it. You obviously don't want to apply so much force that it just crushes the this tail shaft extension. Now I am recording this over doing this with my right hand. Honestly, I'm not looking at individual, but pulling it for a demonstration. Alright, that'll be the going there, so we'll get a punch. Yeah, she's starting to go now. There it is. All right. All right, so now we got that seal driven out. You might notice there's a an oil light bushing in there. Um, I'm going to do a reading with a inside diameter micrometer or with a uh, telescoping gauge. That's what it is. I'm going to do a telescoping gauge reading on that and the end of my output shaft to make sure because I see a little bit of scoring going on in there and while that's not the end of the world it it's definitely something that we want to look at and uh, if we did want to replace that obviously it's much like driving in uh, any other bearing you do want to find the right driver size for it that's a little bit finicky and you want to make sure that you align the uh, the hole for that bushing with uh, that right there so that fluid can make its way under the outside of that shaft as it's uh, making contact with that bearing basically but I think that's one of those things uh, we'll cross that bridge when we get there if uh, I decide that it is uh, in need of replacing but other than that I think uh, it's high time we get all of these pieces cleaned up again I am going to do that off camera so not gonna bore you with that 
and I'll bring you back when we are all ready to reassemble everything. Alright, so we got our uh, parts pretty well cleaned up here. Got our front case half ready to go. So, first thing to do for reassembly is we're going to get both the main input bearing pressed in. And by pressed in, I mean percussive force, of course. And then we're going to put our uh, front output uh, shaft bearing in right after that. So in our kit we got uh, three roller bearings. We got two of these and one of these. This is uh, obviously, obviously got a bigger bore in the center. That one's going to go there and the smaller one's going to go over here for our front output shaft. So, just so you don't get those two mixed up. Alright, let's get this party started. Don't mind the classical playing in the background. Alright, so we're going to use our 76 millimeter seating tool here. We're going to counter right on in there. And we want to do this right where it bottoms out so that way we can uh, fit our snap ring in there. So now we've uh, established that the bearing is in fact bottomed out, we're going to go ahead and install the corresponding snap ring like so. Go ahead and start it off. A little bit of a challenge, but obviously not impossible. So I'm going to slide my screwdriver in there just like that. Oh, let's get a little bit better lighting in there. Apologize, I'm not exactly a uh, Spielberg level cinematographer. Do my best though. Yeah. And that's her. I do believe. Yep, that is fully set in there. Okay. Beauty. All right, so let's go ahead and get our front bearing installed. All right, that one seems to be bottomed out. Go ahead and install the corresponding snap ring for that one. And there she is, I do believe. All right. No problem. All right, so we're going to install the seal for the front output shaft right here. Now, the uh, the bell end, if you'll forgive me for calling that, is going to face outward like that. And then there's a spring containing the, uh, the inner seal. Call this the oil slinger. So basically, it's going to press in this way and then you're gonna be uh, uh, installing it just like that and I'm gonna be using a uh, bearing race installation tool for this of course you can just take a uh, a brass uh, dowel punch right here and go around the perimeter very slowly and easily but I got the tool, so I am going to use it.
All right, we just want to make sure it's fully seated around the entire perimeter of it. And I think we uh, pretty well got her. A little dust in there. Get that off. All right, so now the next big idea is we're going to go ahead and install our front output shaft. We have the threaded side. We want that to face out. Flip her up just like this. And spline section that should fit very nicely right there and it does no problem okay so now what we want to do is go ahead and get our so now we got that on we're gonna take our yoke which we did a uh, extremely professional spray paint job of we're gonna fit that over the splines press that into the seal real nice and good like all right spins freely very good so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our uh, rubber seal here it's completely bi-directional and it looks like this we're gonna slip that over the threads whoopsie Thr slip that over the threads till it bottoms out And we got most of the way there, it looks like. Let's go ahead and go ahead and prod at it with a flat head. And it looks like about as good as we're gonna get it, no problem. So, I'm gonna take uh, the washer for the yoke slip that over that that should interface with the seal there and then we'll take our lock nut thread that onto there just like so all right so this part's a little bit tricky but it's not intrinsically difficult so i got is uh, i got two two by four spaced uh bottom of the case half off the bench so that way the uh front output shaft clears so what i'm going to do here is i'm going to take a pair of channel locks uh with some electrical tape i'm going to hold the yoke just like this with one hand and then I'm going to torque the nut for the output shaft thusly with the other hand. Now I have this set to 130 foot pounds. Official spec from the Ford Motorcraft manual states anywhere between 120 to 150 foot pounds. Uh, I'm going to split the difference somewhat roughly and I'm going to go to 130. Of course you have uh, that whole entire 30 foot pound range to contend with. So that's what I'm going to go with. I mean you can go with 150 but I just don't think that's necessary. So let's go ahead and torque this bad boy on there. Oh baby, whoo! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> so here's the setup. So here's the setup that I had to go with here. A pair of channel locks with uh, a like clamp. Man, that was a lot more difficult than I remember it being. Of course if I had to recommend anybody do that I would recommend taking a piece of flat bar and drilling uh, some holes for these respectively and uh, using that to press up against uh, that side of the case when uh, you're turning it because holy man that was uh, that was kind of a struggle nobody said it was gonna be easy it was easy uh, everybody be doing it but that's uh, one big hurdle 
that we jumped over successfully. So let's move on to the next one. All right, next up on the list is we're gonna go ahead and install our sun gear and make sure the, uh, the milled notches face upward to interface with the corresponding cutouts in the case and we have done that make sure it's fully seated and it is we'll go ahead and take the large snap ring it's only one snap ring that's this big so it ain't easy or uh, <laughs> ain't it ain't difficult to identify go ahead and toss that puppy in there there and that's the screwdriver. Okay. Get that in there. Just like that. All right. Got that well and out of the way. We'll go ahead and install our planetary gear set. Shaft side facing down. I want to be nice and careful here. Right, that is in there I do believe now we're gonna go ahead and flip the case half this way we're gonna support the planetary gear set with uh, one hand now, this task isn't easy to uh, show on camera however uh, I'll do the best I can to document this experience all right so we got it properly set up here go ahead and uh, show you what we're gonna do here we're going to install this large snap ring that fits over this part right here the best way I found to do this is to simply push it on like so and then take your snap ring pliers spread it apart a little bit and walk it back walk it back that way you gotta help it along a little bit you gotta help it along not a big deal then let's take a screwdriver just uh, help it along its way if need be you can also take your snap ring pliers and help it along too. And all the while you're gonna be pushed on the back of the planetary set. Gotta be honest with you, this ain't the easiest thing I've ever done while trying to record, but country boys make do or something like that. That's pretty well it. All right, I'm gonna call that a success. All right, so now the next big deal is we're gonna go ahead and install the oil seal for the main front input. And again, we want the, uh, the seal part facing outward. And this is gonna get pressed into there just like that. And we're just going to go ahead and make sure that it is fully seated and it does look like it is. All right. 
and with this case half in the same position I'm gonna go ahead and install our uh, shifter shaft seal which is this right here now there are two sides to this there's uh, one with uh, letters and numbers and such facing outward and then there's one with a groove uh, molded into it and we want the groove to go in and we want the letters and numbers facing out so it's going to go in there just like that you could use pretty much whatever tool you feel like I'm going to use a half inch socket so just push her in there like so that should do it go ahead and check it against the shift shaft Feels like we're doing pretty good on that, so I'm going to call that a win. Alright, so now comes time to assemble our shift cam and shifter lever assembly. So this is our shift cam right here. This is our shift cam assist spring, complete with the bushing that goes on the end of the spring just like that. Now of note, the shifter cam itself, notice the pattern here. This part that swoops upward is going to face this way, just like that. And there's a set screw on the bottom. We want to make sure that's backed out just enough that we can slide our shift lever into position. And then what we're going to do is we're going to put our spring inside there. And it slides into this notch in the case just right there. And it also rests on the springs. And we have to assemble this all in one unit. So while you're pushing down on the cam, you're also going to be inserting your shift lever. And of course it's keyed to... Uh, fit it accordingly so this isn't too terribly difficult I'll just demonstrate how I do that all right so here we go so I'm gonna go ahead and assemble the spring in the cam the bushing slides into that groove right there just like that and then we're gonna put the spring in its place let it rest there and then we're going to take our shift arm, stab it in the hole. And while pushing down on the cam, we get the shift lever pushed all the way into position and ideally not knock over your supporting two by fours and uh that should do it we check it for functionality Ow. and we appear to have uh complete functionality all right all right so now that's all in position we'll flip the uh shift lever this way that such that it exposes the uh set screw right there and we'll go ahead and tighten that bad boy up I'm pretty sure there is a torque spec for this. Not exactly sure what it is. And by the way, we do want to make sure our shift lever is pushed all the way in before we tighten her down completely. Pretty sure there is a torque spec for this, but we're just going to give her hand tight. That should be perfectly good enough. It would be nice if uh, my Torx bit didn't get completely stuck in there. Okay, so I think uh, next course of action is we're going to go ahead and replace the, uh, the plastic uh, bushings on our shift forks here. 
and I think the way we do that is yeah so we'll go ahead and take some needle nose squeeze the back end and just kind of push them out your kit come two new ones for this exact shift fork you just insert them like that and and like that and for our other shift fork there come three ones just like it he's just pop right off usually one two probably be easier from this side wouldn't it and there's three Then what you do, then what you do is just pop them right back into place. The new ones that is. The new ones are taking a little bit of coercion, but they are on there. Nope. Maybe. Okay, there we go. So there's that. Now what we're going to do is we're going to make use of our bottle of ATF here. And I'm just going to drizzle a little bit. Some of that gear. Right there. A little bit down in that needle bearing inside the planetary set. And we'll drizzle some on our high-low shift hub here, right along the teeth. Don't need a pile of it, just enough to, you know, get it slightly lubricated. We're going to install the teeth down into the planetary set. Just like so. That should be perfectly good enough for that. Then we'll take a little bit, put it in those plastic bushings there. A little dab for each one. And then facing this way with uh, this bearing bushing deal on this side of the uh, shift rail pilot hole there. We're gonna take, we're gonna install the shift fork onto the high-low shift hub and then place the fork bushing inside the high look or the uh, inside the shift cam and all you can do I'll drizzle a little bit of ATF on the shift rail here make sure it's nice and lubed up like so go ahead and insert the shift rail through the shift fork and down into the hole in which it rests and we're going ahead and shift the uh, cam down into there into that position now what we're going to do is we're going to take our main shaft complete with the pump installed we're going to gently stick her right down in the hole there making sure that the uh, 
the uh, operating arm for the pump itself goes down into that groove right there and it does which is great now one big fatal flaw with the uh, 1356 is that during normal operation this uh, pump arm will dig into the case which is uh, what you can see right here there's this uh, divot that's uh, dug into the uh, magnesium housing of that case on ordinary circumstances that shouldn't be there but because this uh, case operates the way that it does uh, complete design flaw on the part of the engineers uh, over time this will uh, weaken the structural integrity of the case itself but uh, I have an app for that so the big idea here so I'm going to cut up this piece of uh, 3 16 flat bar so that it almost perfectly fits into this uh, pump uh, arm groove there. I'm not exactly sure what you call it. And I'm going to cut it widthwise so that it fits down into there. And then I'm going to cut off a certain portion of the uh, pump arm. And then I'm going to weld this piece of steel. And what that's going to do is it's going to evenly spread out the uh, force of this arm. Uh, so that it doesn't continue to uh, dig a groove into that side of the case. Because during normal operation, if you don't know how this works, is as this shaft, main shaft is spinning, there are... Uh, check valves that pump uh, fluid all throughout the shaft and uh, into your bearings and such and so forth and what it does is it relies on that groove there that boss to uh, keep it in place so that the pump doesn't spin along with the shaft and so that it does pump things but uh, in doing so as I just said it wears a groove inside there and uh, that's kind of bad so we're gonna go ahead and take the arm off of the pump via these two uh, bolts here and I'm gonna measure what uh, what I need to cut off and uh, what dimensions I need to make it and then we're gonna fit it accordingly and then I'm going to weld up uh, whatever piece of steel I fabricate to that arm. And then we can uh, fit this right back on. This is what I come up with. Took a little bit of uh, time and fiddling around, but I got the top of the uh, pump arm marked where I need to cut it. And I did measure and hand fit it to where it just snugly fits into there. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pop these two eight mil bolts off. I'm gonna get the pump arm off, cut off the 
nibble there, a little circumcision if you will. And then I'm gonna weld this bad boy right to there where I've got it marked with that line. This is what I came up with. So we got the uh, piece clamped to the arm there, and uh, I'm gonna give her some uh, light welds. It's fucking fireworks, man. Just absolutely brutal today. So uh, yeah, we're going on that. Alright, those definitely are not the prettiest welds I've ever done, but you know what? They're structural welds, so they'll definitely work. Nothing a uh, little bit of emery cloth won't take care of. That's perfectly, uh, perfectly good. That is exactly what we want. We just want something to hold and uh, keep that from screwing up the inside of the transfer case. Okay, progress report. It fits, it sits, and uh, I'm kind of happy with it. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and reassemble the rest of the case and uh, we'll be laughing. All right, you're gonna have to ignore the fireworks in the background. It's 4th of July territory and uh, well, explosive fireworks just got legalized here in Iowa, so uh, every, Pretty much every person that can buy fireworks is. Yeah. Pretty crazy. So uh, now we've got uh, the pump arm situation rectified. What we're going to do is I'm going to pull this back out. I'm going to lubricate the uh, all the splines themselves. Uh, you shouldn't need me to do that, but... Once I put the shaft back in, I'm going to put the uh, pump filter back in that groove, and then your magnet's gonna go back in that slot there right on top of it. Our next consideration is going to be the drive chain and sprocket assembly. Uh, we're gonna make sure that the driven sprocket is going to say rear, facing up, and then the main four-wheel drive sprocket has this hub facing upward. And then uh, as we did lifting it out, we're going to install both gears or sprockets, however you want to look at it, into the chains. And we're going to lift it all into the case as one unit. All right, here we go. It's going to get a little bit hairy, but... Not too terribly difficult. There we go. All right, that's that assembly. All right, now what we need to do is install the washer and then the small uh, holeless snap ring. So it's gonna go on there just like that. And then we just slide this guy over top of it so it can get a little bit hairy of course we can use snap ring pliers to expand it 
I don't know why I didn't do that first off, but no, I need the smaller ones. Well, and you just slide that right on, and then it just falls into the groove. Make sure it's all seated, and it is. And there's your uh, complete drive chain and sprocket assembly. Don't know if I mentioned this before, but you'll definitely want to drizzle a healthy heaping of ATF all over your chain and sprockets too. Now that, that definitely helps. All right, so now on the agenda is we're going to assemble our four-wheel drive lockup assembly onto our shift fork here. Now this is going to point down. And then there's sort of a uh, an angled domed part, and then there's that. We want the domed part facing up. All right, real quick, I need to make a correction. The high-low shift hub actually has to have the flat facing upward and not the other way around. <laughs> Sorry about that. Don't drink and make videos, kids. You got the whole entire thing assembled, checked for basic functionality, and, uh, well, something wasn't right, so corrected that right quick, and uh, now we're back in business. So we'll go ahead and slide that onto our shift fork, that over top of the shaft, and then we kind of just... Man, these fireworks are terrible. Yeah. Sort of just work it into place until uh, it all comes together. Now we should be able to slide that on. There we go. Okay. Just had to slide the uh, shift cam back a little bit. All right. And uh, I don't know if I mentioned this or not. This is called your four-wheel drive lockup assembly. So, uh, that being done, we're going to take our spring, slide it over the shift rail. This is uh, our return spring, so uh, that's what that does. Now what we're going to do is we're going to uh, take our four-wheel drive hub, slide it over the splines, and the uh, these castle nut looking deals here, those go down, so those should match up with the... Uh, uh, the, the cuts on the uh, drive gear. Now what we do is we take our corresponding snap ring. And then you slide it right into the groove. That's how that's all held into place. Well, nice and good light. And we're pretty well done with the front case half assembly. So uh, we're gonna take the back case half, we're gonna assemble it over there. All right, we're gonna go ahead and press our rear bearing into place. It is the same size of bearing that we used for the front output shaft. So get that set in there. Make sure this sets just right. feels pretty well bottomed out to me yep that's uh pretty much it we're ready to uh assemble the two case halves and what we're going to do first is uh take a uh, shop towel hose it with some brake clean make sure we get all the rtv between the two surfaces off of there and uh uh clean it up with some brake clean and then uh We'll apply RTV as necessary. All right, I got both surfaces cleaned up with uh, brake clean and also got rid of uh, any of the, well, most of the chunks of uh, RTV remaining on these surfaces here. There is a June bug that just flew into my case. Get out of there. So anyway, um, 
<laughs> had to deal with a June bug that just flew into the case there. So uh, yeah, I cleaned up both case halves on the uh, where they're both going to clamp together. And what I'm going to be uh, using is this uh, Permatex Ultra Gray. Theoretically, it really doesn't matter what you use. Um, I'm just using Ultra Gray and yeah, you can use pretty much whatever you want. So I'm going to set you up in time lapse. It's going to take a few minutes and um, get this uh, thing put together. Okay. Excellent. Well, now we got uh, both sides of the dowels seated. Go ahead and um, I'll go ahead and start chucking this together. We're just going to toss the screws on lightly and sort of hand tighten them because uh, for this type of RTV, you want to just hand tighten it at first, and then we'll come back an hour later and then we'll torque it to spec. So, while that's uh, setting up over there, I got uh, this guy right here. This is the rear uh, seal for the rear extension housing, and that just presses in there like that. And uh, the best tool to have is uh, one of these. Is what I've been using to press in uh, the other seals it just works like an absolute charm so I'm gonna fit uh, excuse me I'm gonna get the right one that fits this and then we're just gonna go ahead and uh, pound it in well evidently I don't have a driver big enough for that that's okay I'm just gonna take a uh, wood dowel and beat it like a red-headed stepchild well, I kind of know it's lame to blame not having a uh, proper tool for this, but uh, I mean, it's in there. It's going to hold, so no complaints there. One more thing, and I can't believe I almost forgot this. Got to install a snap ring for the rear shaft. We're gonna get that down as far as we can. Then we're gonna pull up on the output shaft. That's gonna expose the snap ring, snap ring groove, which uh, should be able to drive it into place now. And there it is. All right, so off camera, I very liberally uh, coated the bottom of the extension housing with RTV. You don't want to do it here because there are certain places where, uh, you know, the RTV just doesn't cover. And so what we're going to do is you'll notice uh, the outline of where the extension housing used to be, the parts that weren't covered by it. And we're going to use that and uh, 
It looks like it went on like this. Yep, okay, I'm cool with that. So let's go ahead and put that in its place. I don't know about you, but I kind of like that right there. So let's go ahead and put those bolts in just like we did with the ones on the main case half and then uh, an hour later we'll come back and we'll tighten these all up so all these t50 bolts get torqued uh i forgot what the torque spec is uh but i'm going for 30 foot pounds And to be completely honest, you actually don't even need to torque these to a spec. You just need to make them a little bit tighter than what you did. Tighter than what you did. Um, and when you first uh, snug them up by hand. But this gives me a little bit more peace of mind. I don't like staying up at night wondering whether or not my uh, you know, RTV is going to hold or not. A problem sleeping as it is so uh, yeah that's pretty much what we're doing here ah, and there's that so that is all 16 bolts torqued and with that we are 99% of the way to having this thing done. There's only one thing left. But that's going to have to wait 24 hours because, well, uh, our TV has to set up. And because uh, I poured quite a bit of ATF in the case, trying to assemble everything, it's going to be, well, it has to cure for 24 hours before you... Uh, it makes any contact with fluids so now we just uh play the waiting game i guess uh, i'll see you in 24 hours <laughs> yeah normally i don't recommend against a product but this uh this permatex ultra gray stuff yeah this ain't it chief this has been sitting for the last two weeks, curing away, and most of it still ain't dry. Yeah. Yeah, it ain't no good. Alright, we got one last final step which is we're going to go ahead and install our four-wheel drive range sensor um, important to know this little aluminum washer here we want to hang on to this the whole time we got this sensor unless you're replacing the sensor which doesn't happen very often we're going to take our uh, 22 millimeter uh, 7 8 also works on this just gonna snug her down a little bit. You don't want to go Hercules on this. Just want to give it enough torque that it sits in there real nice, just like that. All right, so we got a 100% assembled Borg Warner 1356 transfer case. The only thing I'm gonna do now, and that I recommend you should do too is we're going to go ahead and do a basic functionality check and so what i'm going to do or what i've already done is i've taken the uh, uh shift lever and i've shifted it all the way up as far back as it can go which this should give us two-wheel drive and uh since my case is connected to a manual transmission i'm going to go ahead and spin the input shaft and that should spin only the output shaft, which I'm spinning it right now. Yeah. 
and that's spinning the rear shaft so that's good so I'm going to take our handy dandy little crescent wrench here and shift it one position back we're going to spin our input shaft again that should give us fur by and it most certainly does that's four high by the way and then we're going to shift it back another position and that should give us neutral should so I'm spinning the input shaft and nothing is happening either there or back that way and then last and certainly not least gonna that should give us four low so once again we're gonna spin our input shaft and it seems to be in a reduced state we'll check the back make sure that's spinning appears to be well ladies and gentlemen that is a mostly successful <laughs> had a few setbacks mostly successful rebuild on the 1356 Bohr Warner transfer case uh, again this is um, a manual shift application for electronic shift it's a little bit different um, I personally am not uh, very fond of the electronic shift ones I find that they fail more often than not another thing that uh, I wanted to touch on just a little bit is this uh, Permatex ATF gasket maker. It, it worked a lot better than what I found with the uh, Permatex Ultra Gray. It's also from Permatex, but um, yeah, that just didn't work very good, and uh, I ain't happy with the results of that. I let this. Uh, I let that RTV cure for well over a week, almost two full weeks, and uh, it still wasn't fully cured. So, with that out of the way, this stuff is definitely very much fully cured. I recommend spreading out just a thin little film layer, just enough to cover the entire surface of it, and then uh, just basically follow the directions, and this stuff... Uh, Cured really fast, and uh, it seems to have done a good job of sealing it all up. Uh, of course, time will tell, but I have pretty good confidence. So anyway, yeah, that is uh, my personal take on the Borg Warner 1356 transfer case rebuild video. I uh, hope that helps you out. If it didn't, uh, apologize. Not uh not the best doing these kind of uh, guides, not most helpful anyway. And uh, if it did help you, then great. Uh, happy to be of service, and uh, that's probably the last video that I'm ever going to make uh, as far as being instructional. It is so hard not to swear. It is unbelievable. Uh, which, by the way, I don't recommend you watch any of my other videos. They are absolutely laden with hideous amounts of profanity, and you're just going to end up hating me. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's uh, just uh, the kind of dude I am. But, um, yeah, that's pretty much it. And, uh, by the way, I don't know if you noticed the ZF5, but... It has something to do with that. So, uh, look forward to that if you're interested. Chunks of uh, RTV remaining on these surfaces here. There is a June bug that just flew into my case. Get out of there. Where did it go? Are you serious? Is this real? Here, let's try to force him. Oh, 
I don't know if he's still in there, but if he still is, he's uh, he's there for good. 